Welcome to the InfoQ Podcast. The InfoQ Podcast is a software engineering podcast brought to you by the team behind InfoQ.com, a software engineering news site which aims to help progressive software dev teams adopt new technologies. We're also the people behind the International Software Conference QCon. I'm Richard Sroder, and I was at the Agile Alliance Technical Conference interviewing presenters and organizers. In this particular podcast interview, we're talking to Lisa Crispin of Pivotal Labs, who helped organize the conference, and Justin Searles, who delivered a session entitled How to Stop Hating Your Tests. This is Richard Sroder. We're at the Agile Alliance Technical Conference here with Lisa, and I want to give you a second to tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Lisa Crispin. I'm a tester on the Pivotal Tracker team, Pivotal Labs. And um, I've been a tester on Agile teams for, oh, since 2000. And I was a tester and programmer and customer support and all kinds of things before that. Uh, and I like to share my experiences and I like to come to conferences and learn stuff. So um, this, for this conference, I had the opportunity to be on the program committee and help to shape the program. So that was a really exciting opportunity. Have you done previous Agile Alliance conferences? Is this something you've been I this went before? I went to the very first uh, XP Universe 2001, which is also here in Raleigh, Uh, and I went to every XP Universe and every Agile Development Conference, and then when it became the combined Agile 2000 whatever, I went to every one through 2011, and I skipped 2012, 2013, and then I did 14 and 15, so I've probably done more than anyone else. (laughs) So why have the technical conference? This is the first year doing this, I mean, especially as part of the program committee. Why? What problem are you solving? Well, um, that was a, it's an experiment by the Agile Alliance. Uh, the board members, Declan Whelan, proposed doing an experiment like this because back in the day when we had the first XP Universe conferences, they were mostly developers that came to the conference, and it was mostly about development practices, XP practices, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as well as the, the values and principles. But... Um, and for some reason, as the conference grew, the topics moved away and more into process and frameworks like Scrum and Kanban and Lean. And um, I think some of that has to do with what uh, Sandy said in her keynote this morning of it's the people that make it succeed. And so how can you enable the people to do their best work? And so that maybe was more important in a lot of ways than how well do you refactor. But... Um, But still, the number of developers who attend the Agile, the big Agile conference has dramatically gone down as a percentage. And even submissions of development track sessions. So uh, we we need code. (laughs) And and so they just felt like it would be a good experiment to see maybe a smaller conference because personally, I think a lot of developers would rather go to a smaller conference. Mm -hmm. They tend to be more introverted people. Um, and something that where they're going to get more hands-on, more practical stuff, and not, you know, not that the other things are bad, but just a chance to learn from their peers. Yeah. Do you think the Agile Alliance is maybe seen by some of the smaller companies or even startups as kind of the old guard, and it's almost t- taken as for granted, of course we're doing Agile versus maybe the enterprise, but is that some of it too? Is maybe trying to recapture some of that excitement from early Agile by getting people back into the tech or talking DevOps or some of these newer concepts? or Yeah, I don't know for sure, but I, because I wasn't in those discussions, but yeah. that, does seem, that does seem like it makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's like we have, like, that, now that Agile is mainstream, it is being adopted by big enterprises, and, of course, the, the people who sponsor these conferences, that's the audience that they want to talk to, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's still a place for, yeah, we need to help the small companies, the startups, and... That's usually where the innovation comes from as well. And I think the Agile Alliance does want to encourage innovation. Yeah. And, you know, it's a nonprofit. It's trying to help us all develop software better. Right. So it's a good way to do it. Yeah. So we just got out of a session about pair programming and some of the advances in that. I mean, coming from a testing perspective, where do you see that impact? I mean, when we think about pairing and testing, are those even... Is that just part of all the pairing life cycle? Do you see it, the testing part of that as anything unique or anything evolving? How does somebody think about testing and pairing together? Well, um, you know, I do like to pair test. Uh, I And I think my team faces the same challenge a lot of teams do. We often don't have very many testers. Um, I So I don't have any other testers in the office to pair with right now. I will soon. And when, I, when we did have a tester in the office, we made sure to pair at least one hour a day. We were on separate teams, so it's it's a little harder. But you know, hey, if I pair with you today and you pair with me tomorrow, we've 
we've given just as much value to each team, so that's good. Uh, I and I would another model would use at Cloud Foundry is to actually have the testers pair to write production code with the programmers, right. which I would certainly be willing to do. I'm not a coder anymore, but um, but as Laurie pointed out, just explaining your code to somebody else improves the quality of your code. So uh, so I'm not opposed to doing that. I haven't been able to really get the programmers on my team to do that with me, but they're doing something now they call micro pairing with Lisa. And so when they want to talk about tests or show me what their code does before they commit it or any, have any kind of testing related discussion, they just say, hey Lisa, would you come over? And so I'll sit with a pair and we'll talk about stuff and look at their BDD tests or whatever it is, just for a few minutes. And then they go back to their regular pairing. And that's been an interesting, we just started doing that. That's been an interesting experiment as well. And maybe it would lead to more pairing just to get a taste of it for them. It's like, what's it like to pair with a tester? And, mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited about that because I don't like having to work by myself all the time. Now I've seen, I've seen some more of that though. I mean, okay. we at the office have also been doing that before where it was, you know, almost got rid of a dedicated tester. And a lot of those mm -hmm. testers would become kind of quasi engineers and would pair along with other engineers. Do you see that? I mean, trying to break down those silos a little bit and not combine the disciplines because they are very different. But do you see value in that? I mean, do you like your micro pairing? Would you like to see that explode a little more into more regular things? I would like to do it more. It's just a problem of scale. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're the only, you know, only tester for eight or 12 programmers, um, how does that work? And, you know, is it, I think it can only work if some of the days that you're pairing, you're pairing on exploratory testing or pairing on writing charters uh, because that's, that activity has to happen as well as writing the production code. Or maybe just pairing, well, of course we want to exploratory test as we go, and the developers do exploratory testing themselves at the um, story level, and I've been trying to help them develop those skills. Um, but we also need, to, it's really important to explore at the feature level and look at all the ripple effects and how does this uh, this new feature affect these other older features and right. uh, what's you know what are our different users and different people with different jobs using our product how are they going to use it what are they going to try to do what scenarios will they try and oops we didn't think about what this person would do so i think those are all really important activities and so I think it's fine as long as, you know, it would be great if the developers participated in that and we paired on all that stuff. I'm not sure that's, I'm sure not, I'm not sure they're interested in doing that, <laughs> but it's something we could experiment with. Yeah, no, I love to hear you describe kind of the all up, almost QA angle of not just testing, you know, a line of code or, but it's testing the scenario. Jeff Sussner wrote a great book on designing yeah. delivery and it was this focus of what's the future of QA that's often that not just testing a feature, but voice of the customer, bigger perspective of quality. It sounds like that's what you're describing. Do you often see that as the role of testing that it should be, that it takes a step up and it's looking at the customer's perspective across the functionality? Definitely, I mean, and I don't like to call it QA because we, are not, we cannot assure quality all by ourselves. <laughs> uh, I like the whole team approach to quality, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I do know developers with good exploratory testing skills, but not so many. And I do think developers have to be more focused on that part of the code they're working in right now. They couldn't work any other way. Um, testers have the freedom to always be looking at more of the big picture and to be taking time to think of personas. You know, working with designers, working with analysts, working with other people on the team that are thinking about who are the personas, who, what jobs do the people have who use our system, how are our product, how are they going to use it differently from each other? It's like, wow, I'm a, I'm a, our product's a project tracking tool. So, gosh, I'm a really busy product owner, and I want to, I want to enter, you know, a whole bunch of stories for this epic at one time, and so I'm going to click really fast. I actually found a bug doing that because when you click the plus button to add a story too fast, it caused a problem. So, uh, you know, just to kind of think of the different users and scenarios that they might do and, tr and explore them, try them out. Um, we like to use the exploratory testing charter format from Elizabeth Hendrickson's Explore It book. Mm. And we find that very helpful to, you know, define a charter that's narrow enough that you're not gonna just spend too much time on it, but not so narrow that it's restrictive. So you still have some freedom to, you know, follow your nose, like, oh, I think that might be smelly over there. Let me go try it. Mm -hmm. uh, or, golly, I don't think that, I don't really like how that widget works. How do how do our 
competitors do that yeah. and you know, take a look at them. So, um, so I think it's a it takes a lot of practice to get good at that, just like it takes a lot of practice to get good at coding. And so to to be the person who can do all those things extremely well would be hard. How do you pick what to attend at conferences like this? So, I mean, what's oh, your goal man. when you come to something like this? Are you spontaneous or do you plan ahead? No. What, what's your point when you come to a conference like this? I do look at the schedule um, ahead of time and try to make a plan, but I do vary it. Um, so I just, I'm looking mainly for practical things I can take back and try as experiments with my team. Um, or sometimes I just go because it's like, wow, that person came all the way from Germany. I want to see what she has to say. Um, but but I'm flexible. Like today, uh, during lunch, I got I went to the um, fun over study room to do sketch noting. We, we did mob sketch noting. That was really fun. And then uh, Llewellyn Falco came in with the the uh, what are these people's names? E e Pam E Pam. I don't know how they say their name. One of the sponsors here is running a contest. You can win an iPad by getting the most points at Tetris. I don't even I didn't even know what Tetris was. But we started mob programming on this, and um, and I've I've done it before just in, at conferences. But I ended up staying in that instead of going to a session because I was having a lot of fun. It's something I want to get more experience with, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was just something really different. And the energy in the room was just awesome. And that's that's a kind of like serendipitous moment you get at conferences, and you learn something outside the session you weren't even expecting. Um, and I do, the other thing I like to do, I wasn't able to this morning because of my program committee duties, but I like to go to, to have lean coffee in the morning. And oftentimes a topic that comes up at lean coffee will jog my thoughts of, oh, I want to learn more about that. Is there anything on the program or is there anybody here I could talk to, you know, and just make, you know, set up a time to talk to them. So, um, so I like, I like to have a plan, but you know, I'm, I'm, fl I'm agile. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa, for doing this. This was great. This is Richard Sorother here at the Agile Alliance Technical Conference on what is today, Thursday the 7th, as we're kicking things off. Here with Justin, you want to introduce yourself a bit and what you do with yourself and what you do for fun? <laughs> sure. Well, my name is Justin Searles. Uh, I'm a co-founder at a uh, software agency called uh, Test Double. Uh, we, we our mission is uh, really pretty humble, I think. It's to identify all the ways in which the software world is broken, and then we're going to go fix them. Uh, so we work with businesses all around the world uh, uh, to, to help developers level up uh, and to uh, ship great code alongside teams. Awesome. Uh, as for what I do for fun, uh, most of my spare time is spent maintaining uh, uh, old open source projects I don't use anymore, uh, check on flight delays, uh, and then complain about things on Twitter is uh, my my pastime. And your Twitter handle? Uh, just my last name, Searles. Awesome. Uh, if you're listening and not not reading this, it's like pearls, but with an S instead of a P. Yeah. So it's the first time we're doing the Agile Technical Conference mm -hmm. here, and I believe you've had some exposure to the previous Agile Alliance engagements here and there. But what do you think is the reason they spun this thing up? Yeah, well, I don't have any insider information. I've uh, been fortunate to come through the XP community uh, and spend a lot of time in Agile land as an Agile coach and as like a change management consultant before spinning off more into, I guess you'd call it like the open source world where we're, we're, we're mostly, uh, you know, people don't talk about Agile a whole lot anymore. Uh, it's just become sort of this... And I don't even think it's conscious. Uh, the ideology that a lot of, frankly, a lot of developers are sort of, you know, they come into it without even having names for it. Uh, the, a lot of the processes that we picked up are just sort of uh, uh, the, the new defaults. And so in telling people I was coming to this Agile Alliance technical conference, which was trying to reconnect a lot of the uh, thought leaders and innovators from the Agile world with technical practitioners, uh, uh, you know, I think that, it struck a chord with people uh, in a way that said, yeah, these two things have fallen way out of touch. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great stuff that we could learn from, uh, from, from just a rigor perspective. You know, let's, let's get talking about object-oriented design, domain-driven design. Let's get talking about, uh, like I just came from a talk from uh, 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 James Lewis from ThoughtWorks on uh, uh, combining the concepts of Conway's Law and microservices, which is a fantastic, uh, really, really thoughtful talk. Whereas when I go into open source land, right, they're all, you know, hip technologists who are doing agile stuff pretty well. 
none of them have heard of Conway's Law. None of them have thought through those hard problems of like, you know, how our human systems uh, map to our code. And so I think that the, there's a tremendous opportunity to kind of bring back or reconnect uh, uh, some of the stuff that's just taken for granted in software land to its first principles or at least to like its sort of like, you know, founding concepts. Do you think the other way as well? I mean, I think that you mentioned, you know, maybe those who've come up recently with this, and this is just common knowledge or kind of understanding some of the more human complexities. Do you think the purpose then was also the other way? Is people who've been now taking the agile religion over these last few years have gotten more separated from the tech, and this is also a chance to focus on that again? Or As a matter of, like, logistics, I'm sure that this conference is mostly agilistas who are kind of reconnecting with the technical side, yeah. uh, but, uh, but that's because of, like who the Agile Alliance reaches. Uh, my hope is, uh, for, for, by hook or by crook, through marketing or something, we'd be able to ultimately arrive at a, at a successful conference series that, that really merges the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this is a community that has a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom to give. Uh, 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 the open source community, I think, doesn't know that they're missing it. Uh, or just uh, when I say open source, the default general development community writ large, and vice versa. I mean, some of the, um, you know, I think part of the reason why the Agile Alliance has been able to uh, 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 kind of march along for so long is that they do have developers in the room, but those developers work in big banks, big enterprises. They're still doing Java, they're still doing .NET, uh, and there's enough developers left in the room to, to sort of justify the exercise when, in fact, I think, the people excited about Agile tend to be more, uh, uh, the focus has been more on process, on, on project managers, uh, and people higher up the, the food chain executives and how to make Agile organizations, which is all great stuff. But I think it's lost lost a connection with the work, with, with the actual art of development and the development practices. So you mentioned you uh, spend a lot of your time with things like Go and Node.js and JavaScript. and. Where do you see, I mean, you mentioned kind of the classic, hey, Java.net developer may feel like they've got a lot of the tool support and, and whatever. Maybe it's not keeping up at the same rate, but there's some established things for testing and running through this process. Do you feel that that's there with Go and Node and JavaScript? Is that coming up to speed? Are there things that are more innovative in those areas when you think of front-end testing or you think of other things? Describe for us kind of the state of affairs you see in things in more modern languages. I see two phenomena. First, in any in any language ecosystem, there is a maturity model or maturity like a life cycle. You start off and everything like no one's built the test runner before. No one built the package manager. You know, you see uh, like Rust, for example. You have Tom and Yehuda now. Yehuda writing his third package manager. So like he wrote. Um, you know, like Bundler. He was able to take all those lessons learned and apply them. Uh, Ruby. Ten years ago, it was the same way. A lot of Java thought leaders who really cut their teeth in XP, TDD, uh, JUnit were able to uh, apply what they'd learned in a new and fresh context in Ruby, uh, which which was phenomenally successful. Um, uh, so, so there's just that. There's the natural, like you know, right now there's a Cambrian explosion of innovation in in all the new languages, especially just because JavaScript has eaten the world in in JavaScript stuff. Uh, uh, and so there's a lot of churn, a lot of innovation happening there, whereas Java, .NET, they're way deeper into their maturity curve. Most of the dust has settled. There are established patterns for solving a lot of the problems. And a lot of the type of, you know, uh, cage rattlers have, have they've since left the room. They're, they've moved on to, to greener pastures because they want to be, you know, shaking things up and innovating in, in areas where that's needed. Uh, so, so there's that as, as a phenomenon. But to the second point, and getting back to the, the whole first response about like I, I wish that there was more of a connection. When I see as a as a as a as a self <laughs> self identified uh, testing and TDD uh, uh, aficionado, uh, when I go into JavaScript communities where there's an order of magnitude more developers than anywhere else, it's yeah. I don't love this the, this idiom. It feels like blind leading the blinds. Like people know testing is good, uh, and there's a lot of tools for it. But I, and frankly, I think a lot of those tools are very ill considered or, or or naive in the in in the opinions that they proffer. Uh, the APIs, uh, like for example, I wrote recently uh, after years of complaining about it. I wrote a uh, uh, a library called testdouble.js. It's on npm as testdouble, which is a little bit of a brand confusion because my company's name is also testdouble. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I got the npm name for myself, and I did it because a lightweight, lean mocking framework 
didn't really exist for, for, for JavaScript. Everyone's using this thing called sign-on, which it suits some people fine, but I feel like the API is uh, people have to work against it to be productive. And what I really wish that we'd see is let's take some of the lessons learned from the Agile community writ large, from these other legacy, uh, 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 not to use legacy as a pejorative, but more mature language ecosystems. Like, frankly, Testable is just me re-implementing Mokito, which is a Java library that was written uh, probably 12, 13 years ago at this point. So maybe not that long, but but it's definitely, you know, it's these aren't novel ideas. I'm simply just, you know, uh, taking advantage of my ability to cargo cult them. So <laughs> so so that's being a bridge is, is one aspect. The other bit is, like, I want to be where the people are. You know, there's a ton of people learning JavaScript right now. It's the new default. Uh, 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 you know, I there's a reason why I don't spend a lot of time, you know, trying to teach Clojure developers how to write better tests uh, because most Clojure developers are really advanced developers. They can self-soothe. Same goes for Elixir or Elm. They can figure things out on their own because they're self-starters. Uh, but uh, not to say that JavaScript people aren't self-starters. It's just a huge, like, it, because uh, uh, it is the new default uh, language that people get flung into, there's a tremendous opportunity to, to, to meet those people and to help them out. Um, so, so that's just where... I want to be spending my time, and I, I feel like the best thing the Agile Alliance could do is just call it like Agile Alliance JavaScript Conference or JS Conf for Agile. You know, to get kind of like more of the, the the soft skills or social and organizational thinking stuff to that community. Yeah, no, that's a good point. What about Go, which is even newer? And in that case, my my grasp of Go developers is they're typically also more advanced developers who are coming into that. Are those frameworks starting to catch up? Do, do you see, or is that also a group where people are starting to still craft their own or they're just kind of making do with what's available. I feel like Go is a really interesting... Uh, Go is a humble language, in my opinion, because I think that a lot of the very, very skilled, experienced developers have embraced Go almost because it's not super expressive. It's because all of the, th the ways, like, like Ruby, for example, is full of sharp edges and things you shouldn't do or know better than to do. Uh, Node.js, in, in a lot of ways, as much as I, I love uh, uh, how productive I can be in Node, uh, has, a, has a lot of kind of intrinsic design things that just make it very easy to write very problematic systems. Go is like a language, kind of sort of, like, it's a suitability language, as Gary Bernhardt gave in his great talk on capability, suitability. Kind of like Java was written to put in bumper lanes for all those C developers who are writing all of these buffer overflows everywhere. I feel like Go is a suitability response to all of the dynamism uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that's, that's been popularized over the last decade. It's like, no, we can write much uh, uh, more scalable systems, both from a throughput as well as a maintainability perspective, if we give the actual application layer fewer constructs to play with, less expressivity. And so from that perspective, it is by design less interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I almost feel like the, the human phenomenon, the people using Go and the different reasons why they've, they, they've come to love it, uh, it, that's the interesting part to me. Um, whereas as the, the language itself, uh, for the people who are, you know, um, uh, more interested in helping kind of like r polish off the, the rough edges in different language ecosystems, uh, uh, I just have less to do there. <laughs> so I don't spend as much time in the Go community as I might, but if I was starting a new business, uh, that, that had to be rock solid and had to be reliable and had to be scaled up to a really large team, then Go would probably be a pretty good choice because it's a safe bet. Interesting. Last question for you, as you think about some of the new application patterns, and maybe they're really just new veneer on the classic things of mobile or high throughput Internet of Things things or mm -hmm. different asynchronous messaging, things that we may have done in variations before but now are more prominent. Does that change your approach to testing when you've got more complex distributed systems with more moving parts and more microservices now? I'm not testing a monolith. I'm testing something comprised of... 45 different services all connected with an ephemeral messaging backbone. I mean, there's, those fundamental constructs are different. Does that change your approach to testing, or does it still focus at the higher level capability, and that's plumbing to you? Okay, that's a really, really great question. And I think it's, um, I, I, would, I would kind of, I have, a, I have at least two responses. I, this is my last question, so I'll just keep talking until time runs out. <laughs> um, now, seriously, uh, first and foremost, I separate in my mind uh, testing that I write as a developer to 
uh, be sure that my code is working in the small to give myself a sense of progress, to slow myself down to make sure that like the APIs that I'm writing, the objects that I'm writing are are usable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I write really, really isolated unit tests. So even if like what I'm writing is ultimately embedded, or ultimately uh, you know this really cool new space, mm -hmm. uh, 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 like mobile, like Internet of Things, like a wearable. Uh, it's not going to change at the end of the day that I've got these listings of small objects and I'm going to write isolated unit tests against those listings of small objects for whatever the behavior is. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, that's, uh, it has a sort of timeless use, uh, uh, usefulness. Uh, that, that skill is never going to expire. That's never going to go out of vogue. The what to do about integrated testing. What does that mean when I need a device lab of 35 different types of devices or if the system, uh, as you might describe it, is like, all of these different machines or all these different microservices, another, another popular permutation. And for that, I think that, um, you know, speaking of communities that open source developers and startup land uh, doesn't connect with well is, is there's a lot of really rigorous thinking in the QA community. Mm -hmm. We don't talk to them a whole lot. They show up at the Agile conferences, so it wouldn't be so bad for, for, for them to connect here. But um, I have always viewed full stack uh, testing and automation, automation of that stuff uh, not as a an ends unto itself. It is a means to good QA people, good good testing, uh, to remove the drudgery, to automate the stuff that is brainless. Like let's go through the system and do all the stuff we know really really well, so that we have time in our week to exploratory test. Let's get creative. Let's try to think of ways uh, to either break the system or to use it in an unexpected way and make sure that users are going to get value out of that system. What inevitably happens, especially as the systems get more complex and there's more moving parts, is that QA teams that, that, are, that are focused primarily on automating a lot of full stack tests is eventually there's an inflection point where the tests stop serving you and you start serving the tests. Mm -hmm. And now it, it's more than a full-time job just keeping up with all of the uh, uh, breaks that occur because of course of business changes to the application code. Um, and so that's, in my practice, when I talk to QA people, a lot of it is helping them, helping liberate them from their own full stack tests, helping them uh, identify ways of, you know, uh, uh, budget maximums. Uh, uh, say like you only have a five minute budget for your build to run mm -hmm. and if something doesn't fit you have to make the system faster make your test faster or throw away a test uh, giving teams permission to throw away automated tests and, mm -hmm. and it reintroduce exploratory testing in certain cases or find ways to uh, instead of uh, you know write a whole bunch of redundant tests that do create, read, update, destroy against every single resource in a system. Uh, instead, snake through all of the various features with a single smoke test that tries to interact with as many of those kind of uh, related features as possible as if you were a real stakeholder. Um, so there's tons of different strategies that I think are stuff that the ATDD, uh, acceptance test driven development, and then later the BDD movement, it's stuff that Dan North is blogging about in 2008. So I don't think it's a, it's a change necessarily uh, in the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it, maybe it's just that the, 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 the hardware reality got, got really interesting and we still hadn't learned the basic lessons of like how to test a web app. Mm -hmm. So, so it's an arrested development problem when you come to the full stack testing. Uh, either way, we, we still collectively have to get a lot better and more disciplined and just have a better language for, for how do we talk about good QA, good full stack testing, and as developers, how do we go about designing the, the automation aspect? Awesome, Justin. Hey, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time.